I'm now going to introduce Richard Murphy. Richard is a member of the PEF Council. He's an expert on tax. He's a professor at City University. He's the author of a best-selling book called The Joy of Tax. Hi, Richard. Um, let me have your comments on the 2020 budget. Well, this was a budget in two parts. One was the tax on front end, which was about coronavirus, which almost unrelated to the rest of the budget, which was clearly written a week or two beforehand, which was about how the Conservatives were going to deliver their manifesto promises, none of which now look realistic in the light of the coronavirus crisis. Looking at those two parts, and they are quite distinct in my opinion, the coronavirus element played to the crowd and played very successfully to the crowd. I mean, Rishi Sunak has got lots of plaudits for being the Chancellor who's risen to the occasion. I have to say I don't agree um, at all on that issue. The total real stimulus that he's provided to deal with coronavirus is 12 billion, not the 30 billion that the headlines say 18 billion of that was going to happen anyway, I think. 12 billion split 5 billion for the NHS, it would seem, and 7 billion for smaller businesses. Well, there are 5 million smaller businesses in the UK, and if that 7 billion is split between them, that's just 1,400 pounds each. That's not exactly gonna go very far in terms of helping small businesses who are major employers in an overall sense within our economy survive this crisis. So I believe he did lots of token gestures which are really inadequate and will not provide much support for that community um, and which frankly in my opinion mean he's probably going to be back at the dispatch box within weeks certainly before a scheduled appearance in November to deal with the emergency that is going to develop over the coming weeks and months on that issue. Looking at the second part of the budget, that which dealt with the Tory manifesto promises, I'm actually pretty disappointed as well. Uh, there are obviously some aspects of this which look as though he has gone for a period of fiscal stimulus. And there's no doubt he's spending more than has been the case over the last decade. He is going to be borrowing to spend, which makes complete sense and which is something I've asked for the government to do for a long time. But the overall level of that stimulus is actually really quite modest in terms of the need. Let's look at one simple example. I'm a member of the Green New Deal group. We estimate it will cost a trillion pounds to transform the UK economy to really be durable in the face of the climate change crisis. That's 100 billion a year. The total additional spend that he talked about on climate related issues is less than 10 billion. He's putting 27 billion into road building. He is fundamentally missing his targets, which are the necessary ones to achieve real transformation. He's not going to deliver jobs in every constituency of the UK. There's no evidence that he's really going to level up. This is a budget which has missed most of his targets. And staggeringly, tax was virtually ignored. The government appears to be saying that it can end austerity because it now has the fiscal space to do so. Do you think that's right? I don't think the government is saying it can borrow without limit. In fact, what we very clearly heard him say was there's going to be growth, although I think the prospect of that is frankly zero, um, that there is still a fiscal rule in place and that he is going to match it and that he is going to see overall the borrowing fall as a percentage of GDP over the life of this parliament. Now that to me is not borrowing without limit, that is borrowing within a new set of rules. He has announced there is going to be a new fiscal rule, it's a very good question as to whether we need such a rule, but certainly there is a borrowing without limit in here. He is basically continuing with the household analogy that the government is is like a household, that it has to repay its debt, that debt is a problem when I don't believe it is at all, um, and he is not spending to the limit of what is going to be necessary. And what is going to be necessary is very rapidly going to be a massive fiscal incentive to ensure that we can restore this economy to full employment, because over the coming months we are going to see many and by many, I mean hundreds of thousands of businesses fail in the UK, in my opinion. I'm already talking to businesses who are talking about turnover disappearing by the day. And now, you know, in March, when we're recording this, 15% down on what it was in January. Most of those businesses cannot survive that scale of downturn already. They're talking about how long can we survive? And nothing that he's done is going to help that. So we are looking at a 
an economy going into crisis. And the level of spending he's talking about is one that is simply trying to put a sticking plaster over some of the consequences of austerity which we have suffered over the last decade, but nothing which tackles the problems we're really now in. Government debt has risen during the austerity decade. Does that mean that the austerity years have been completely wasted? I, I think there is an admission in this budget that the last 10 years have been a mistake. I mean, the whole of the Johnson approach is to say, this is a new government, this is not a, another conservative government of the style that went before. He has rejected Cameron and May and tries to present himself as something entirely different. The logic of George Osborne, that we must balance the books, is quite clearly history. So in that sense, look, this is a change of mood. And I think um, Rishi Sunak is doing what he has been told, asked or whatever to do with regard to the delivery of this. The idea that there is now a constraint of we must balance the books come what may has clearly gone. So that's good news because that completely bankrupt uh, logic is now history. Yeah, but that, that's big, isn't it? If the arguments against austerity have been won, what should happen next? I don't call it big if the consequences are still going to be that we're going to be in a mess. Um, and so I'm going to slightly disagree with you there, Patrick. My concern is that actually we're going to end up with something way below full employment as a consequence of the logic that is still in place. And that they haven't turned around and said, we will do whatever is required for the economy as a whole. We only heard we will do whatever is required with regard to the NHS. But the NHS is not the whole economy. The whole economy is going to be in deep trouble. What we actually need is a Chancellor who recognises that, frankly, the scale of the deficit they're going to place is face is going to be completely beyond their control. This is a Chancellor who clearly does not understand the sectoral balances. The sectoral balances are very simply that if everybody but the government decides to save, and in a recession, that's what happens. Businesses don't borrow households don't borrow, and the foreign sector holding sterling balances tend to remain as savers. They don't borrow in sterling. Therefore, if all of those insist on being savers, the government is going to have to borrow because that is the inevitable consequence. This is not economics. This is just an accounting identity. As a matter of fact, the government is going to borrow. And the deficit is going to go way beyond anything that he has forecast. So what we need is a, is a Chancellor who doesn't just talk about, I'm going to manage a deficit, but a Chancellor who realises that the deficit is probably going to go beyond anything that we saw in 2008, that is going to be of historic proportions, and that he's got to realise that he has to use that situation creatively to create new opportunities for full employment. We have made one baby step beyond austerity at the moment. We have said that the, we have removed, or he has removed, the constraint that we must balance the books. But to move on to the level where we say full employment is the priority and the government will do everything it can to achieve that goal is another much bigger step, and I don't think we've achieved that as yet. Austerity over the last decade has caused massive problems for poor and vulnerable people. There's been an increase in poverty, a reduction in income, uh, mental health problems, uh, suicides, life expectation has been reduced. Do you think the government should be apologising to those who have suffered as a result of austerity? I've done some research on government borrowing over the last 75 years and the Tories have always borrowed more than Labour. Um, by a very large proportion. And that's because their policies by and large fail. Their attempts to balance the books actually result in them borrowing more. And that's what's happened over the last decade. And the result has been stagnant wages, poor investment, low productivity in an economy, frankly, unable to face the challenges that are now being presented. So clearly the Tories have failed. They should be apologising. But they're in office. They're not going to apologise for this. What we want to look at is how are they going to react to the crisis that now exists. And my concern is, and I have actually looked at this, in 2015, Rishi Sunak, when he was talking about the Chancellor's speech of 2015, he as a new MP said the objective of government was to live within a balanced budget. 
I believe he still thinks that. He used the household analogy. He said, we're constrained by the need to repay the national debt, which is nonsense. You have never repaid the national debt. We never will. The national debt includes the pounds in your pocket. And how do you repay the pounds in your pocket? It's impossible without replacing them with other pounds. So this sort of nonsense language that he's got, which still underpins his logic, is still there. So what we need to do instead is have a completely new approach, but he hasn't got anywhere near that. Let me ask you about fiscal rules. Yesterday we heard that the current fiscal rules have been abandoned and we're going to hear in a few months' time what the new ones are going to be. What do you think about fiscal rules? Uh, do we need a fiscal rule? And if so, what do you think it should say? I don't think we need a fiscal rule at all. I don't think we're going to have a fiscal rule. I think that by the time we get to the point of actually discussing what the new fiscal rule will be, which would logically be an autumn budget, then the situation will be so out of control with regard to the economy, it'll be so apparent that the world is different from where we are even in March 2020, that the idea of a fiscal rule will be abandoned. Curiously, I was listening to the budget yesterday with one of the senior economists from a right-wing think tank um, in a BBC studio. And when he heard that mentioned, his immediate reaction was, well, that's the end of fiscal rules. And I went, brilliant. And he actually said, I think you've won that one. And I believe we have. The fiscal rule era is over. It seems that the influence of the Treasury on the economy is now to be diminished because Downing Street seems to have taken control of the Chancellor. Is that a good thing? Do you think that the Treasury in the past was too cautious and had too much of a cautionary effect on the economy? That is what is happening. We are undoubtedly seeing the role of the Treasury being diminished. I mean, that is why Sajid Javid was got rid of because he wouldn't kowtow to Downing Street and their requirements and Rishi Sunak has obviously agreed to do what is requested of him. Is that a good thing? No, it's not a good thing. Um, why? Because frankly, a prime minister out of control needs a powerful focus of opposition. Given that we do not have a powerful focus of opposition within Parliament at the moment simply because the government has an 80 seat majority. That opposition has to come from somewhere else and traditionally that's come from the Treasury. Now, I'm not endorsing the traditional Treasury view by saying that. The traditional Treasury view, which is incredibly conservative with a small c, and prudent and focuses on balanced budgets and is always inherently against spending, yes, was wrong. Well in the past, though, it? it hasn't succeeded. So the Treasury needs to relearn its view. The Treasury needs a new view. The Treasury needs to come into the 21st century and learn what economics is really about now. But that doesn't mean to say we actually need to throw out the Treasury as a center for excellence on economic policy within government. We need that center for excellence. What we need is a treasury that understands what it's doing. What do you think was good about the budget? There were a few small good things, I would say. Um, there were some token gestures around getting rid of unnecessary tax relief. I mean, entrepreneur's relief was a hopeless tax relief and it has been cut. That shows that there is an awareness, at least, that there needs to be a review of tax spends and one would hope that that goes further. They didn't go far enough, but that's good. Some of the measures with regard to removing uh, the burden of business rates on small businesses um, is useful because I think that will keep some businesses going in high streets, but it's worrying that, in fact, the large number number of losses in the high streets are in fact big chains and they did not get any support so the measure did not go far enough. So there were some small measures. The willingness of the government to accept the cost of statutory sick pay for smaller businesses, which most people thought was always paid by government but wasn't, was again useful. But these were so small in comparison to the problems of either inadequate reaction or the whole focus of policy being in the wrong place, mm -hmm. that they are completely overwhelmed by the overall failure of the direction. You're an expert on tax. Do you believe that the income from taxation should cover day-to-day -day spending? Is that a rule that we should be sticking with? Absolutely no way on earth do we need to have a rule where government expenditure is covered by taxation. Government expenditure can be balanced by three factors. It's a very simple equation. Um, it's government expenditure equals taxation, but plus the change in borrowing, plus the change in the amount of money that government creates, which at the moment we tend to think of as quantitative easing.
Now, there is no way that those need to be balanced. The focus of all policy, from my perspective, has to be the creation of full employment in a stable, long-term, environmentally possible economy in which we are all going to live in the long term. There's nothing about that which says the government has to balance its books. And saying so is to completely misunderstand stand the fact that the government is the creator of all currency. Nobody else ultimately creates currency. And I'm well aware that some people say, but isn't 97% of money created by banks? Yes, under government license. They only operate because the government lets them do so. My argument is, in fact, that all currency is created by government, and that's fundamentally what the national deficit is. Now, I see, therefore, no reason to balance these books. And right now, and let's turn this whole thing on its head, we have to remember that government borrowing is private wealth. It is simply a savings mechanism. As we're recording, the stock market has fallen 9% on the day in question. So far, people are pouring out of stock markets. They want safety and security. There is only one institution that can provide them with that safety for their savings right now, and that is government. And that is why the government is going to run a deficit, because people are going to pour money into their coffers trying to save in government bonds. And so the idea that we have to balance the books when actually the whole role of government funding is to actually go much further than balancing a budget, but to provide an underpinning for the economy, including for savers, including for providing liquidity, including providing for long-term full employment, including providing environmental stability, is nonsense. That is so low a priority, it's of no relevance. But most commentators in the media, and of course the IFS, are being very gloomy about the outcome of this budget, because they're saying that this spending is unaffordable and it's all going to end in tears. Well, they're wrong. It's as simple as that. They are wrong. Because their logic is that we somehow have to repay government borrowing. We haven't repaid government borrowing since 1694. That's when we started accumulating the national debt. Well, it's not quite true. I think in 1805 we might have cleared it. But you know, one year, apparently, we did apparently clear it. But you know, irrelevant, and it's over two centuries ago. We have government debt. Government debt serves an absolutely fundamental role for people's savings. It serves a fundamental role with regard to underpinning the banking system. It plays a fundamental role in underpinning the pension system. The idea that we would ever want to repay it would be, well, economic lunacy. There literally would be no money left for a start, because over 80 billion of government debt is notes and coins in people's pockets. Now, what are we going to do if we eliminate those? Well, I suppose we could have a cashless economy, but most people don't want that. So this idea that we're going to repay the debt makes no sense whatsoever. It presumes that the government is the same as a household, as the same as a business, but that ignores one simple fact. I would love to run unlimited debt, but the fact is I can't create money. And the fact is that the government can. And the fact is that only the government can, because the government's promise to pay is always good. If the government says, I'll pay you, it always can, because it can always create the money to pay. So government debt is the most secure, safe asset in society, and it is literally the underpinning of private wealth. If you doubt me, go and read Jane Austen's novels. Look at what the definition of wealth was in the Jane Austen novel. It's a man who's got money in the three percents. That was a government bond. Um. We heard a lot in the budget about spending on physical infrastructure. But what about social infrastructure? Do you think that the government should have been spending money on recruitment of nurses, teachers, doctors, care workers? Look, I fundamentally agree with you. I think we need an investment in social infrastructure. One of the big problems that I see out of this particular budget was that we heard that we are going to have cuts in business rates. Now, 50% of all business rate revenue does, for example, go straight to local authorities. And local authorities are, of course, the providers of most social care in this country. And social care requires the employment of a lot of actually quite skilled people who aren't paid very much. And are we going to see those people at jeopardy as a result of this business rates cut? We haven't seen the balancing equation here as yet. And this is true in so many areas. We heard extra funding for FE colleges, which I certainly welcome, but we didn't hear about how, for example, universities are going to be supported post-Brexit, how universities are going to be supported post-coronavirus, when many of them are going to face major financial risk because they are going to see their revenues fall. We haven't seen how, apart from the emergency measures, 
metrics of recruiting retired doctors, which isn't going to happen, by the way. Um, as somebody who's married to a retired doctor who's not going to go back to work, I can say that with some confidence, that people are not going to go back to work. What we need to be doing is actually spending up front on training. We have forgotten in this country the merit of actually providing high quality, long-term training for life so that people adapt to the changing environments they live in. But this is something that is still not present in the logic of government as investment and yet it is fundamental to our long-term well-being, the transformation we need, the productivity gains that we require with regard to those areas of the economy where that can be measured and not all parts of the economy are subject to productivity measurement. But where that can be measured we need those changes and yet this is apparently missed by government. It's a really serious omission. Another part of the failed Treasury view, if you like, that needs to be the subject of re-education of the Treasury to make sure that the funding goes in the right direction. So in summary it seems as though the arguments against austerity have been won, but I don't think we're seeing the end of austerity. For example, there doesn't seem to be much in the budget to increase spending on local authorities, on schools and on justice. But real spending has fallen substantially over the last 10 years on most areas of discretionary government spending, including justice, including probation, including local authorities, social care and so many other areas. Are we seeing any change in those? No. Did we see money moving into those areas? No. Are we seeing a commitment to enhance government services as a result? No. We might be going to get a bypass a tunnel or something around Stonehenge, but we're not seeing the basic services on which people are going to rely being invested in so that we rebuild the strong underpinnings of the social infrastructure of the UK, and that really worries me. What did you not like about the budget? This is actually a budget that's going to haunt Rishi Sunak for the rest of his career. He's made claims about what is going to happen that are completely untrue. He said we're going to see growth. He's said that the deficit is going to be managed. He's said that he's going to deliver vast amounts of infrastructure spending, but which actually he's going to have great difficulty delivering in the way that he says. He claims that coronavirus is going to be short term and over and done within months or a little longer. In fact, we are heading for a major economic meltdown. He has not seen that. It's on his watch now. He didn't say it. He didn't say he's planning for it. And for that reason, this is a disaster of a budget because it's going to actually leave him, the government, which we're stuck with for a number of years yet, fully exposed to risks that they've set themselves moving in one direction when they should have moved in a completely different one. And for that reason, this was a disastrous budget. <laughs>